Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Thanks for being here as always. And as promised in a previous video, I'm gonna run you guys through the basics of etching your Damascus blade. I did a video a little bit ago uh, called Damascus 101 or how to forge pattern welded steel. And I went through the basics of how to do that. Now the blade that I finished on the Damascus 101 video was going to be the subject of today's video. However, unfortunately, that's not gonna happen and I'll show you why. All right, so this is the blade that I finished out for the Damascus 101 video and it's fully heat treated. It's um, rough ground and could be finished out into a nice little blade. I actually really like this blade design and handle and everything and I'm gonna make some more like it. However, there's a pretty serious delamination right here on the blade. And even though it's far enough away from the edge that you know, I could probably make this into a knife. That's simply not, <laughs> hopefully that's obviously not the kind of quality that um, you want to have, at least I want to have in a blade. And so uh, it's scrap at this point. Uh, I don't think I can grind this out any further. Now what happened is, if you watched that video, you, you saw that I got a little bit of a delamination on one of my forge welds. And this is it right here. And what happened was, is I, essentially failed to follow my own instruction <laughs> um, as, as much as I should have, and that's what caused it. In the Damascus 101 video, I talked about heat sinks and how those can adversely affect your forge welds, and that's exactly what happened in this case. I didn't heat my anvil up, and I, I tried to make it happen without addressing the heat sink issue, and it didn't work. Because um, what happens is when you, and I explained this in the, Damascus video so you should go back and watch that but when you have those thin layers of steel in your billet before they're forge welded together those are those act individually when it comes to heat um, displacement and transfer and so when you lay that on your cold anvil the bottom layer of steel you know whether it's 3 16 or eighth of an inch or thinner or whatever that anvil sucking that heat out and it will bring it below welding temperature before you can get your hammer blows across the entire surface of the steel. Um, how did that happen? Well, I, I mean, admittedly, I'm kind of used to using the press lately. It's so nice to have that, um, even though, you know, and I don't heat up the dies on the press. You can, but I don't, um, because the action of the press is so fast and complete in comparison that it's putting pressure over the entire surface that it's touching immediately. And so the steel simply doesn't have time to cool down below the welding temperature um, and to cause a delamination. So um, that was a, an oversight that could have been avoided on my part, unfortunately. Uh, so you know, again, learn from my mistake. And like I say, I didn't <laughs> follow my own instruction like I should have. So that's what can happen when you, when you don't do that. So <sighs> goodbye little blade. What we are gonna be using today though is a couple of nice uh, Damascus blades, 1095 and 15 and 20 steel, both from the same billet. Uh, this is a 294 layer bill. Obviously, we lost a few in the production process as always, so it's not that much, but that's how it started out. So it's got some nice um, layers to it, and it's gonna be a lot of fun to see what what's gonna look like. I already know, because I kind of did a test etch, but you guys will enjoy that, I think. So let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is blade preparation, and the name of the game is clean, and that's not clean. I just smeared some stuff on it. Uh, what I mean by clean is right off the sandpaper. So um, there's no oils, no grease, no fingerprints, um, nothing that's going to in any way inhibit the action of the ferric chloride, is which, which is what I'm using. You can use other acids, but this is going to be about ferric chloride. It's, anything that's going to inhibit the action of the ferric chloride on the steel. So obviously I have to come back and clean these up. Now these are sanded down to the grit that I want, and what I will use is some uh, ammonia or window cleaner to clean these blades off and dry them off before they go into the acid. Now the blade finish that you want on the finished Damascus is what you won't need to have on it at this stage right here. And <clears throat> when you go to put that in the, in the etchant, it's not going to change that. Whatever grit you have on here, that's, what's, that's what it's gonna be after the fact, after it's etched. Now obviously it's gonna look a little different with the different steels in the Damascus blade, but whatever finish you want on 
any portion of the steel that's what you want to have on it at this point pretty much I'll get into that in a minute so this is up to 600 grit now it's not very high but on a higher layer billet you can go with a slightly lower grit you can go up to a thousand um, two thousand and a lot of guys like to do that for this blade for these blades 600 grit is sufficient and I am going to be coming back with a higher grit a thousand grit paper um, and I'll show you how and why okay let's talk about the ferric chloride so I've used a couple different sources of ferric chloride and the one I've used the most is this it's from MG chemicals you get it off of Amazon it's I think it's a quart I don't know it's 945 milliliters whatever that is and it's a concentrated solution it's sold as a copper etchant it's obviously etches uh, steel as well now the biggest mistake that I made when I first got this is that I used it at this strength and I I didn't know any better I guess I didn't research it well enough but this is not the strength you want to use it at now the other uh, ferric chloride source that I've used is the powder that you can get it's in a little glass bottle and that one was also off of Amazon from I think Loud Wolf is the brand name and they sell all kinds of different uh, chemicals and stuff but you get it in a little powder and you mix it up into the, your concentrate solution and then dilute it further so what you want to do with this when you get it is I believe this is this is uh, good for actually four gallons of of solution and so four equal parts uh, one gallon you wouldn't mix it all up at one time you may be at a gallon at a time and it seems kind of counterintuitive but you actually want it to be to look very thin and very um, almost almost clear not not to not completely by any means but by contrast this is not what it should look like this is uh, some ferric chloride that I've been using for a while and it's about it's about at the end of its useful life and it's much much darker now than when it started about at least probably three times as dark so that just gives you an idea hopefully but um, when I first mixed this up you could see through it you know it, almost it was that thin looking it, like I say it's kind of counterintuitive you feel like it's not gonna work but it actually works better if you try to use it like this it won't work very well at all it'll it'll give you a bad edge so that's the first thing um, yeah so that's what I would start with on this is uh, you know four equal parts and mix it up from there um, I'm not gonna do that today you can go on and you look at different videos on how to mix up acids and things like that and I'm gonna screw this up but I am pretty sure you're supposed to always add acid to water I'll have to double check that I can't I can never remember if you do it the other way around bad things can happen but yeah that was the biggest mistake that I made initially when I first started etching stuff was I used this full strength not good so dilute it down Get yourself a nice thin solution. It will, will work better. It will work better for you. It's amazing. So now that we have that established, I'm going to use my slightly old ferric chloride and we'll get into the process. Okay, I have the blades and the etchant. And I do want to mention something real quick that I forgot to mention the blade prep. And that is, you need to make sure that you have any decarb on your blade ground or sanded off. And decarb, of course, is where the steel loses the carbon in it during the forging and or heat treating process. And all of that, particularly in a, in a Damascus blade, should be ground off during the finishing uh, process. If it's not, then it's gonna show up as a white uh, light colored bit of steel or a portion on the blade which is probably going to mess up your pattern so you need to be aware of that and make sure that all of your steel is uh, ground and polished down to good steel that has not uh, undergone the decarb um, issue otherwise it's going to cause problems for you so now that's out of the way on a fresh batch of ferric chloride you want to keep an eye on your on your blade you want to want to anyway but five to ten minutes is, is a good um, no more than ten minutes for sure on a fresh batch in my experience it's gonna start etching that blade pretty quickly 
This stuff is a little slower at this point because it's a little older. So 10 minutes, I'm gonna leave it in there for about 10 minutes. If it gets, and, and you have to be aware that uh, your ferric chloride is going to not be, it's going to start giving you a poor etch, a, a, a muddied look to your blade if you use it beyond its uh, um, life, okay? So you can start to tell when it's not really etching as well as you would like it to, and that's when it's time to, to switch over. I actually have some, I have a new bottle of this on the way, and um, this is about close to the, to the end here. Uh, but uh, it, it'll work for these blades fine. So I'm going to leave these in for about 10 minutes and then we'll come back and uh, I'll show you what to do next. All right, so while that's etching for a minute, uh, let's talk about containers. So I've kind of en enjoyed using this uh, large jar, this large glass pickle uh, jar uh, for my etchant this time around, this mixture, simply because it's got that, that lip that comes in and so the, the opening is a smaller diameter than the outside of the jar, which means I can clip uh, my knives with those uh, little clamps right to the uh, the edge of the jar and there's still clearance all the way around the blade because the outside of the jar is further away and so it's got uh, you know solution around the entire thing. If you try to do that on a straight walled um, PVC pipe or something like that, which I've also used, um, I don't I don't know, I haven't tried that. It might, you know, this is not going to have that clearance around the blade, so I feel like that might affect it. I don't really know. Um, I also have this, you know, this PVC pipe with the cap on it. That's a pretty common, um, you know, setup for a lot of people. You can put another cap on it for storage if you want. Um, I don't have that because I'm not using it like that. I have water in it, actually. I'll show you what that's for in a minute. Um, so yeah, there's different, all kinds of different containers you can use. Just yeah, obviously it has to be, you know, glass or plastic, you know, something that's not going to be affected by the etchant, as any kind of steel will be, even if even if ever so slowly, stainless steel or otherwise. So that's uh, that's my take on containers. So what happens as you're etching the blade is that iron oxide, or oxides begin to build up on the blade, and that's what the dark color is. And so that's, uh, you know your high carbon steel that doesn't have the nickel content in it. In this case, 1095. That's what's going to give you the dark color. And then, of course, the the nickel steel or the 15N20. That's going to that that resists the the etchant, the acid, and that's the bright color. So, in any event, it it, it does etch it a little bit, but not not anything like the the 1095. So, in order for the etch to to continue and to be consistent and clean you have to periodically clean off the iron oxide. Now what I normally do is I'll take some thousand grit sandpaper and just carefully sit, you know, polish that off. And that works pretty good. Uh, but today I'm gonna try something I haven't done yet and that is using some warm water and a toothbrush and just to scrub the, that iron oxide off um, and, and, rest, and get that back in the etchant. And I don't know how well this is gonna work. I don't know if this is gonna be effective or not. I just wanted to try it. Um, seems like it is. One of the reasons why I'm trying this is because you know with sandpaper it more or less kind of rides across the top of the the nickel steel that's not being etched down and uh, it does it does clean everything but I'm wondering if this is not going to be a little more effective and at the same time not sanding off any any of the of the uh, nickel steel so I'm just trying it. So that's that's the process you, know, you put in the etchant you take it out you clean off the oxide put it back in so uh, a reasonable question is how many times do you do that how deep do you want the etch and then that's going to be affected by uh, the the condition of your etchant the condition of the acid like I say older you know older solution it's not going to work as fast or as quickly and a fresh batch I would say uh, it's usually like two maybe three times um, in that five to ten minute window is all you really need uh, to get a, a, a decent etch and what do we mean by a decent etch well my personal preference is I guess I don't you know I don't know if it's a fairly deep etch or if it's pretty uh, nominal or average but I like to be able to feel it and if I drag my fingernail across the surface of the blade I like to be able to feel those little ridges and um, yeah, so if I can't, so that's got to be pretty well defined, and that's that's you know that's where I like to go with it. Uh, reasons I like to do that is because you know for a using blade, as the darker oxide on the high carbon steel wears off, you are going to lose a little bit of that contrast. You can get that back, but um, day to day use that's going to eventually come off. 
and that that higher relief um, on that pattern it's gonna it's gonna maintain that and you're still gonna see it and uh, you can you can get that that contrast back um, through different treatments like coffee and that kind of thing um, so you so I like to have a, a decent a, a decent relief um, on those different on those patterns on those layers another reason you might do that is on a kitchen knife um, you know etching a, a pretty deep relief on the blade that can that can be a, a benefit um, it will keep food from depending on the, the layers and how close the, the ridges are together and that kind of thing but it'll keep, keep different foods from sticking to the blade as you're as you're slicing or chopping and uh, just by allowing or not allowing that um, airlock if you will <clears throat> on on foods so that's that's a distinct advantage that you can utilize in that case too all right, so this is the way that I normally clean off the oxide uh, between each uh, etching bath. And I don't know how well the toothbrush is really working. I don't think the bristles are stiff enough. And so you really do need to make sure that you get that cleaned off. So um, you, can, you can just do it by hand without the uh, steel bar here, but I like to use this. Uh, sometimes just keeps everything nice and flat, but you can see the amount of uh, iron oxide right there. That all needs to come off. Okay, so I'm to the point on this blade, on these blades, where I can start to feel a little bit uh, the, the ridges with the back of my fingernail. And at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here with my uh, thousand grit sandpaper and carefully, basically just polish off those exposed ridges of the 15 and 20 steel and at the same time it's going to be cleaning the oxide off of the 1095 as well but my main my main uh, purpose is to polish off or clean off that 15 and 20 steel and bring that up to a higher a higher grit a higher polish as we continue this etching process and that's going to really help to bring that out so regardless of what grit you go up to before etching, the cleaning process here is going to be really important. And of course you want to have a, a pretty fine grit. Um, but, you know, this is a thousand grit paper that I'm using right here. A lot of guys will go a lot finer than that. And that's just depends on what kind of polish you want on on the finished blade. So yeah, I'm taking a little bit of steel off here on the uh, raised ridges of the of the uh, 15 and 20 steel, but I'm also cleaning the oxide at the same time and just continuing that process. So it's not it's not as deep as I want it yet. I figured out the toothbrush is really pretty worthless when it comes to cleaning off the oxide. The only usefulness I found is that it's it's uh, helpful in rinsing off rinsing off the the oxide. Um, after sanding, so I've been using it for that, but it doesn't it doesn't clean anything off to speak of. So there's that for you. Okay, so like I say, up until this point, uh, we haven't neutralized the uh, the acid on the blade at all. Now I, I like to use ammonia, but um, I've noticed that some some glass cleaners that have ammonia in them are not don't have as much ammonia. They have some water in there too, and so the um, the neutralizing effect is not as good. So I like to go get it in the jugs, the, just the straight ammonia off the uh, grocery store shelf, and then put it in the bottle here. Um, it seems that the, the most concentrated ammonia solution works uh, the best. Some of those glass cleaners don't really do it. So now that I've sprayed that off with the ammonia, I can uh, use this just use this glove and, and the 15 and 20 is already uh, we've kept it clean we have kept it polished it really doesn't take much I'm just gonna carefully um, rub that off and um, you can see some of the there's some you know a little bit of iron oxide coming off but we're not I'm not gonna get too aggressive on that it's it's good to go so um, yeah the next thing is to just make sure that you get this neutralized and you can use a baking soda solution um, I really like ammonia and I just douse it down the whole blade and then I'll just let it sit 
on the blade, let it drip dry. Um, the last thing you want to do is leave any residual acid on the blade move, going forward. So I'll just let it drip dry right here and uh, leave all that excess on there to make sure that we have a good neutral, neutral steel. We're not uh, continuing to etch anything. So put that up. So to sum up that part of the process, I think the final thing I'll just say is that the, the number or the amount of time that you leave it in the solution before you take it out and clean it is going to be directly related to how quickly the iron oxide builds up on there. And that is like we discussed before, uh, directly related to the um, condition of your of your solution and so you know the age etc so you're just gonna have to keep an eye on it you know initially maybe check it after just small short periods of time and go from there all right so now that we have that done let's take a close look at what we have once the uh, once you've properly neutralized your blade uh, throw some oil on it I like to put some WD-40 on it and that seems to work pretty good you can use a number of things, but anyway, you can see what we have here, and the the uh, the result of our labors. This is kind of a stretched ladder pattern, and turned out pretty nice. So, pretty happy with that, and uh, can't wait to get some handles on these and get them off to their new homes. So anyway, thanks for watching. Appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you on the next video.